Welcome to Reimagining Liberty, a podcast about the emancipatory and cosmopolitan case for radical political, social, and economic freedom. I'm Aaron Ross Powell. It seems like everyone is mad at big tech. Progressives dislike it because they think it's too permissive the spread of mis- and disinformation. Conservatives dislike it because they think it's biased against them. Both sides agree that government should do something about it. Which, if you care about a free, open, and innovative internet, is a terrible idea. To discuss the state and future of digital expression, I'm joined by my good friend Matthew Feeney, head of technology and innovation at the London-based Center for Policy Studies. The Supreme Court recently heard arguments in the case of Gonzalez v. Google, which is about Section 230 and ultimately about the future of digital expression, the, the ways that we can communicate on the internet and the, the liability of platforms for the communication that happens on them. And that seems like a good way to jump into the broader question of how should liberals approach the question of digital expression, of freedom of expression in digital spaces? Yeah, it's a, a a good launch launch pad because it's the first time that the Supreme Court's thought about this particular law in, in a long time. Uh, the, the 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 basics of it are in the status quo at the moment. Right, is that uh, the the law basically says that you're responsible for what you say on a online platform, but the online platform isn't, um, with some exceptions. But broadly speaking, that's that's the law. And um, that conversation about Section 230 in the U.S., but also conversations about online speech all over the world, have had me thinking for years at this point about how people who are um, classical liberals, um, how how they should think about online speech. Because I I do think that debates about online speech are um, broken or boring or a bit of both, uh, because we're put in this situation as liberals, I think, where we have a traditional view uh, that free speech is a good cultural value, uh, that it's important for for a free society, while also respecting uh, private businesses and their freedom of association. And I think there's widespread concern that this freedom of association is fundamentally anti-liberal because there's a lot of online platforms allegedly getting rid of content that they should keep up. And much of the debate over the last couple of years in in many countries, I think, just boils down to a debate about values, you know, that you have private companies coming up with different views about what constitutes good or valuable speech. Um, And unfortunately, because I think this debate has um, been broken um, in the ways that I'm happy to talk um, further about, that they were at risk of having some pretty anti-liberal regulation and laws being passed. Uh, So I think yeah, classical liberals really do need to think um, with more imagination um, and with more originality about uh, free speech in the digital age. You're right that this gets framed as a debate about values, and particularly the people who are most often incensed about, say, deplatforming are conservatives who think that specifically conservative values are being targeted by these platforms. And we should talk about that, but before we get there, I wonder how much of this is really a debate about values versus being a debate about bigness. And what I mean by that is in in the real world, the non-digital world, meat space, as the cyberpunk authors call it, we, we have lots of venues for conversation. My house is a venue for conversation. Our, the, the company we might work for, the school that we're in, the church we belong to, these are all places where people can come and express themselves. And all of those set standards based on values. If you come into my living room and start spouting Nazi stuff, I'm going to kick you out. And that's not really a – that doesn't spark the kind of heated debate that, again, is framed around values that we see with digital platforms. And what seems to be different is the idea that getting kicked off of Twitter is very different from getting kicked out of my living room in the sense that Twitter is huge and so you can reach thousands to millions of people there and 
So getting kicked off of it radically limits the the range that your speech can be seen from, the the reach of your speech, I suppose, in a way that these other venues do not. And and the debate is often is about Facebook, Twitter, the big platforms. It's not about the Mastodon instance that I happen to be on. So is this really about values, or is it just that people object to the fact that digital communication has largely concentrated among a handful of very big platforms? I think it can be both, um, but the point on bigness is important, uh, because I think if you are um, an American conservative looking at this debate, the impression I get is that um, American conservatives view big tech as just another part of the uh, the, the, the left-wing hegemonic blob that also includes academia and Hollywood um, journalism or the other stuff there. Um, however, uh, sometimes I've seen people exaggerate the bigness. I mean, your example of Twitter is a, a good one because if you are a uh, journalist or in politics, then Twitter seems very, very big, but it's it's not really. It's a relatively small fish compared to the um, the leviathans of uh, Meta and, uh, and Google. Um, and that's important, but I think what you've put your finger on is um, one of the, kind of the the lack of imagination that I, I think a lot of people in this have, which is you look at the fact that you're being kicked out of what people call the public square. You know, you lose a Twitter account or, or a Facebook account. Um, and the, the, the reach is not to competition or innovation um, in the face of this bigness, but it's to regulation and legislation. So you, you know, you're a good example of someone who uses alternatives like Mastodon, which is um, experimenting with a new kind of social media architecture. Uh, people have tried to build social media platforms um, for unique and, and relatively small communities. And, and that's something I think we, we should applaud. Um, the, the problem is that uh, once you accept bigness as the enemy, you 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 crowd out conversations that are, I think are more interesting and fruitful for liberals. Which is, what does an ideal online speech space look like? You know, why are we satisfied with these centralized platforms? Um, and uh, I think far too many assumptions are taken for granted. You know, for, for years when I was living in Washington, you'd hear all the time that you know Twitter is the public square or these. Companies uh, are basically, you know, common carriers and all, all this stuff that I think um, got taken for granted that really shouldn't have, uh, which was frustrating when there was actually quite interesting things happening. Um, you know, we don't have to go into the details of all of all of the the, <laughs> the platforms that have emerged, but there's there's a lot more going on than just bigness. And um, I think there are ways to acknowledge that um, bigness plays a role while also remembering that values has a lot to do with it. Yeah, it is astonishing to me how much even even liberals talking about this stuff seem to have forgotten that communication didn't used to be concentrated in in bigness. Like the early internet with Usenet and then all of these instant messaging profiles and then the blogosphere, which was interconnected independent platforms. Like it used to not be everyone you knew was on Twitter and Twitter was the only way. And and one of the really striking things, and I think this plays into ultimately the values and gives oxygen to these debates that it feels like we shouldn't really be having because to some extent they're kind of moot given the variety of communication platforms that exist, is it turns into like almost a sneering at the very idea of of alternate platforms, you know, so that the journalists that you talk about, they're like, of course, like, of course we should all be on Twitter. And it's like, why you're, you're on this platform that's run by like the arbitrary will of this guy who seems to be kind of a lunatic. And at least in this domain, not terribly bright about how platforms work. He is clearly like, he's kicking, he's kicking journalists off left and right. Um, when they criticize him, and yet there's this like we can't go anywhere else because this is the public sphere, um, and and so the bigness has. No one thinks that like Comcast because it has like a it is the only game in town in certain areas, is a public sphere, right? Um, but they tend to think of these platforms that way because it's just we've we've forgotten it can be different. 
Um, and, and I think a lot of the debate, and you bring this up in your own writings, like a lot of the debate is simply like, it doesn't, you can go elsewhere and we're not all, we're not all committed to like trying to fix Twitter, which is what say like the section 230 reform people want is basically they want Twitter to moderate in the ways that they would prefer. And they think they could do that through the law. We're not committed to that. We can just go elsewhere, but we've like forgotten that very basic liberal lesson of decentralization and competition as opposed to concentrated power and central planning. Yeah, um, I, that, that's right. And one of the things I think that's been missed is one of the great innovations of of liberalism. You know, one of the one of the greatest things about liberalism is that it removes um, opportunities for conflict in life. Right? That we 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 live in a diverse society and have different views about religion and diet and science and education and sports and all of these things. And in authoritarian countries that aren't liberal, the government just decides, look, you know, this is the state religion or you're not allowed to have a religion. Or they say, we will decide what food you can eat and what you cannot eat. Uh, or, you know, um, you must you know, be a part of this civic institution or not. Uh, and in, in liberal societies, we're really fortunate that non-government institutions emerge like Charities, religious organizations, journalism outlets, uh, nonprofits, these sort of things, where debates about religion, diet, politics, um, all of the things that get people upset um, can happen without the government being involved. I think it's fair to say, like, social media has emerged as one of these institutions alongside, um, yeah, yeah, museums, nonprofits, academia, whatever, uh, where people debate these difficult issues. And although um that's happened i don't think we have yet the kind of governance that has a critical mass of um uh buy-in from the public uh so all new speech technologies eventually come with governance rules and mechanisms right so um a good example might be yeah, uh, editing as a full-time job did not um, exist as we know it immediately when Gutenberg published his first um, printed Bible, right? There were yeah, years and years and years of the culture around books we have today um, taking time to emerge. And it's the same with television. It's the same with radio. And I think we oftentimes forget we're in the relative infancy of um, social media as a kind of means of, of communication and we're still trying to figure out the best way to to govern it. And and the fact that there's so much lack of trust in some of the big um, names um, has led to, unfortunately, um, people reaching for state power, which I think oftentimes um, is blunt, unimaginative, prone to error. Uh, and uh, I, I think we're at risk of squandering an opportunity to actually build interesting new systems that provide something better. Because we're really at risk, I think, and you see this in the UK with the online safety bill and other pieces of legislation around the world, that we're really at risk of some of the most powerful countries in the world, um, at least in the English speaking world, just deciding that the best way to, to deal with this really new and interesting means of communication is to have um, a government regulator just figure out what to do. And that, that I think would be bad for liberalism in the long run, and um, it would be a shame. So you're saying that it makes me wonder if there's another kind of bigness that is complicating all of this, because if we had like going back to the early days of the internet, right, or even before that, but like um, BBSs and you know dialing into different people's computers directly that that were networked in in various ways, that was all. It was non-commercial. Right, like the BBS software that people were running was uh, there were commercial ones, but everyone was running open source. Um, the software you're using to dial in was open source. It was being distributed just because people got in the same way they get value out of contributing to Wikipedia. That's not monetary. They got value out of contributing to this growing digital network, communications infrastructure, and so on. Uh, and and a lot of and there wasn't really much like if the government said, oh, you have to – communications have to function in the following ways. Actually implementing – like enforcing that would have been harder in that sort of environment because people were just freely exchanging software. You could encrypt your communications and so on. 
Um, and we could we could go back to that. But the problem is that the way that most people communicate now, the way that most people engage like with their social media is on their Android or their Apple phones, which have app stores. And those app stores are like concentrated points of enforcement. So if you're a social media app and you do something that violates a revised or jettisoned Section 230 or the the regulations that the UK is passing or whatever, they can lean on Google or Apple to kick you off the app store. And once you're off the app store, you're basically invisible to huge portions of the population. And even if they want your your app, it's hard for them. You have to like jailbreak if it's on an iPhone, which most people are not going to do. And so it seems like the app, or like do the app stores make this basically cut off an avenue for routing around both this debate and the kind of blunt, dumb enforcement that, that you're worried about? Uh, I guess the answer is a very definite maybe. Um, I, and there are a few thoughts that, that come to mind here. Uh, one is it depends on the kind of app you're trying to build. Uh, and there was, uh, years ago, there was uh, this uh, conservative Twitter wannabe app, Parler, right, which then got removed from uh, some of the app stores. And I, I think that was you know, a frustration to, to many of the users, but it was still accessible via the internet browser on, on the phones. Uh, so but there you're talking more about just customer use and satisfaction versus um, the, the app being available. Uh, I still think, though, we're, we're not in a world where there's monopoly yet, right? Um, I, you know, obviously, the dominance of Android and, and the iPhone are, um, uh, go without saying. Uh, but I, I am aware of other people building uh, you know, mobile phones where you will not have to rely on the Apple App Store or, or Android. Uh, and and that, that, I think, is exactly the kind of innovation I was talking about earlier, that you want to make sure you don't stifle. Because you know, one of the worrying things is, is that Google and Apple can run up to Capitol Hill or will you know go into Westminster and say, but but our app stores are clearly the best and we don't have to, but we have the best content moderation policies to remove all of this bad stuff. Um so either um impose um our own rules via law so that we can still function or make it harder for people to um to enter the market by hitting the requirements we have. Um I mean, you know, because I, I, I guess the, the, the classic question our, our former colleague, you know, Peter Van Doren always used to say, right, was uh, the question you should always ask is compared to what and at what cost? So if we're worried about the dominance of two app markets, we should be thinking about, well, uh, compared to what? And it seems to me that um, I'd rather the, the private failure of these two companies than some um, government uh, some some government mandate, but I'm I'm open to suggestions there. You know, maybe there is some light touch regulation that even a libertarian could get um, potentially happy with um, that might solve the problem. But um, I haven't seen um, a solution yet. Uh, but maybe I need to be more imaginative. I don't know. I haven't. What do you think? I mean, there's I've seen arguments, and they're somewhat intriguing about. So, like, if you have an Android phone, you can install third-party apps not distributed through the app store. You can like download the app file and it pops up a warning saying, are you sure you want to do this because it hasn't been checked? Um, and then you can install it. You can't do that on an iPhone. Like Apple, you know, just Apple's culture is to lock down as much as possible and, and limit those kinds of choices as much as possible for its users. Um, and so I've seen calls for basically forcing Apple to allow you to install either third-party app stores or one-click install of apps you download so that the platform itself becomes open in a way that, like, say, Macintosh OS is open. You can download apps from anywhere or from Apple's app store. Uh, that might address some of it, but it seems like a lot of this problem is just cultural in the sense that we have gotten used to having access, being given free access to platforms that enable us to get our speech out to an extraordinary number of people at 
at least zero financial, like monetary cost to us. You know, the cost to us is in our attention and the data that they're mining about us in order to sell ads and so on. But that doesn't feel like a cost to most people. Um, we've gotten used to that and it's become concentrated and it's a very different environment than communication has ever been before. You know, pre this stuff, you could, the best you could hope for is to write a letter to the editor and have it printed in the newspaper, you know, like, um, because you couldn't afford to distribute your own, like, even if you could print your own newspaper, the best, that best you could then do is like hand it out as a zine on a street corner or something. So your reach was rather limited. So it feels like that has changed and people have become, in a sense, feel entitled to that level of reach. And so then the values thing is simply the people who are providing me this owe it to me. And so for them to then take it away from me is doing me a wrong because they're taking away something that I am entitled to. And that seems like, and so then, then that turns into the politicians grandstanding about we're going to force them to platform neo-Nazis or whatever. Uh, but it feels like that cultural shift is what's really behind a lot of this is this sense of entitlement to the use of particular, because as you said, there are lots of them, lots of different digital platforms, but it's a sense of entitlement to the ones we have identified as really important. Yeah, I think there is definitely a, a cultural um, element to it all. I suppose the the problem, especially in the United States, is eventually these cultural concerns hit a, a, a legal barrier. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is even taking the cultural problem as given, right? So there's um, tens of millions of people who feel that they're entitled to a platform online. Um, the problem, at least in the United States, is, well, the First Amendment allows private platforms to kick whoever they want off. Uh, interestingly, I haven't seen anyone in the States um, seriously suggest, well, an easy way to fix this is for Congress to set up a social media site. Just we could have freespeech.gov or something like that, that Congress maintains and every American citizen is entitled to a, an, an account and all legal speech is by law right, um, permitted. Uh, but it doesn't take long to think about that for more than a few seconds before realizing the whole they would be, be, become a disaster quite quickly <laughs> because of the plethora of legal speech most people don't want anything to do with. Uh, these cultural um, assumptions, I think, are, are very stubborn. You know, I, I think we, we do just live in an age where people feel like um, they have uh, entitlement to an audience. Um, but, you know, that, um, that even though it's not going anywhere, that, that's not necessarily a barrier to, to innovation and new products. You know, there's been, um, like you mentioned, you know, smaller things coming along all the time. Uh, and, you know, the people forget, it seems often, that the, the main tech giants we talk about today, they didn't exist um, years and years ago. And there was an internet before Google. <laughs> there was an internet before Facebook. Um, now... I think you know it's a difficult question for for liberals, right? Is well, what 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 do you do with um, private citizens being pri being angry at private companies about their private decisions um, when it's leading to um, government encroachment into one of these valuable um, non government institutions? Um, and I don't know yet um, because you know I've been doing this sort of work for years, and it's it's been interesting to to see it seems to me the the relative lack of a a really robust liberal um reaction to that cultural concern because we we've been very good for years at at just talking about the first amendment and talking about how limited government is best government and how uh private failure is better than um public failure uh, but it doesn't seem to be making people very happy <laughs> uh so i'm still on on the search for what a um a robust um, liberal reaction to the cultural problem you've identified is on the cultural problem by and large what you see is conservatives and people on the right mad because as you said they they view these big platforms which are the only ones that are relevant in in the arguments because they're not thinking about the alternatives they view them as wings of the culturally liberal elite establishment that is 
that desires to force their views out of the public sphere entirely. Uh, and and it seems to be like there's a tension because on the one hand, you see a lot of arguments, and you've made these arguments, that the the fear among conservatives of deplatformings, particularly targeting them, is overblown. That the, the platforms are not as biased against conservatives as many conservatives seem to think. Uh, and so you can and you can also give lots of examples of them targeting people on the left. As well, I had a lot of friends in left anarchist circles who a few years ago were all kicked off of Facebook rather suddenly. Um, it happens. But but on the other end of it, the the progressive left's objections to these platforms and the their arguments, they're not arguing that we need to – they're not arguing from a free speech standpoint when they say we need to reform Section 230. They're arguing from a we need to stop misinformation, disinformation, uh, election manipulation, like there is bad stuff being expressed that needs to be stopped. And it is the case that that stuff, the stuff that they have in mind when they say we need to shut shut it down, is largely coming from the right. It's largely, you know – COVID denialism, election denialism, et cetera, et cetera. And so the conservatives might be wrong about the platform specifically targeting them, but they are right that the kind of speech that they are more likely to engage in is what the other half of the political spectrum wants these platforms to be kicking off. And and so how do the platforms thread that needle? Because it seems like they're if they go the like we're going to be light on moderation they're going to upset the left if they go we're going to moderate away disinformation they're going to upset the right and so it seems like the sides want them to do things that exist in opposition to each other yeah there's been uh, a, a lot of discussion um in in the industry and also in, in public policy about this uh one one answer is one that Mark Zuckerberg decided to pursue, which is to set up uh, a a supreme court of sorts within a private business. You know, this um, oversight board, where um, you know qualified uh, judges, uh, free speech experts, are going to take account of Facebook's content moderation policies. It's going to um, listen to appeals. Um, I think it's fair to say, and I don't know if there's been any polling on this, but I, I'm, I'm um, skeptical that that convinced um, a, a critical mass of American conservatives that Facebook was now treating their speech um, in a you know a quote unquote you know unbiased way uh, because it's still Facebook regulating Facebook. Um, there are though I think other ways. You know, I, I published a, an article in, in February um, talking about ways in which. Uh, social media companies maybe could try and get some kind of user regulation to, to address at least factual claims. And this would be using something like um, some of the lessons from prediction markets, right? That if, allowing users to, to bet on claims uh, as the, you know, the American economist, Alex Tavarock says, you know, a, a bet is a tax on bullshit. And I think a lot of the problem is that, Many people, oftentimes under anonymous or pseudonymous accounts, um, can claim anything without any cost. You can just say whatever you want. Uh, and it can be relatively innocuous, like um, my aunt lives on Venus or something. <laughs> or it can be uh, something uh, dangerous, like, you know, if you ingest this uh, fish tank cleaner, you can um, cure yourself of COVID. And so um, I think... People in the industry uh, should be thinking more about um, solutions like that, that allow for users to regulate amongst themselves, which is to to call out nonsense, to make sure that people put money where their mouths are, even in digital space. Uh, and But importantly, I think lawmakers and regulators need to make sure that people experimenting with these new methods are free to do so. Um, and it's not always satisfying to tell a congressman or an MP well, look, you know, they'll figure it out <laughs> when they're getting calls from their constituents about their uncle who is now believing in QAnon. 
um, and their cousin who's convinced that the Russians handed the election to Trump. You know, and and I think that is um, it, it is difficult. Um, but what we what what I think we desperately need is for people to think more creatively about what um, what kind of governance structures are good for online speech because it did you know it took us a long time as a as a society to figure out what um, what publishing looks like um, what good publishing looks like or what um, what journalism journalism ethics is you know we we just take it for granted that you know we turn on the television and watch the news or we we pick up newspapers from a newsstand um but you know the, like coming up with rules for good journalism took a long time uh and uh, it, it didn't emerge once the printing press um emerged uh and so i know it's not satisfying a lot of readers are going to get a little sick of you know hearing me just say you know hope that we we, we eventually figured it out but i've just been struck by the relative lack of people even suggesting things like um, prediction markets or other things like that. Um, I think we do need to to think a little outside the box. So to be fair, we may have come up with, after a lot of trial and error, rules for good journalism, but that hasn't satisfied people either. Like, lots and lots <laughs> right. of people uh, think yeah. that the rules that journalists live by are are bad and wrong or lead to you know the wrong kinds of reporting or are just generally mad at the newspaper industry in general. Um, like, it hasn't settled it, even though journalism has gotten better. And and that lack of settling it makes me wonder if – so it used to be that social problems, you look around, you see like problems in the world, you blame the devil, right? Like it's the devil's fault that this stuff is happening and we're going to we're gonna excise the, the devil worshippers or the witches and then that will solve it. Um, and then it was, we're going to blame rock and roll. Like it's rock and roll's fault that the youth aren't as into conservative and trad ways of living as they, the grownups wish they were and so on. Like juvenile delinquency is, is the fault of the Beatles. Um, and, and then it was television, right? Like television is what's breaking people's brains comic books and so on like anything we can we can find this right now it's social media social media is what's turning your uncle into a QAnon. it's what's convincing your aunt she lives on venus um it's what's costing my preferred candidate the election it's the reason that the pandemic hasn't didn't end yesterday and so on and so i wonder how much of this is just it is easier to find a particular thing to blame for stuff we don't like in the world than it is to accept that there's going to be stuff we don't like in the world. And social media and digital platforms happen to be the thing right now, even though they're not – conspiracy theories existed long before there was Facebook. Um, and people believing dumb things existed long before there was Twitter. And elections went in directions that we didn't like or were actually stolen long before there were digital platforms to do your election manipulation on. Um, and so have we, on the one hand, overestimated the role of social media as a cause of these things? And and then if we have, does that mean that – does that complicate your quest for other, for like actual answers because people aren't actually looking for answers? They're rather just looking for something to blame. Yeah, I, I guess it's the, the question is, um, are people really upset about the amount of misinformation on Facebook or do they really enjoy the dopamine hit they get while being angry about it? Yeah, there's this kind of people getting a rise out of being upset. Um, you know, look, I, I do think that uh, social media is different. There is... Um, it's just easier to spread a lot of nonsense. So it, it's it's true to say, look, you know, people have believed nonsense for a long, long time, conspiracy theories, all, all this other stuff. Um, but I think the reaction to um, content you don't like gets more dangerous the less in control you feel. So the the um, you know the example of um, possession or witch witchcraft, you know what. Um, you know, the innocent women who were, were killed during the Salem witch trials, I think they would have had a view about overreaction to um, potential uh, outside forces. 
uh, and people upset about rock and roll um, really did push for there to be significant regulation and curtailment of what people could hear um, on the radio. And, uh, it, and it's not just, a, you know, uh, speech technologies. I, I think uh, the, you can look back at the invention of the automobile changing society forever because it freaked people out uh, or a certain section of society out that suddenly young people were kind of free to, <laughs> to get out of, go, go places absent parental supervision. Um, so yes, it's, it, you, you, and, and I think you're seeing now that there is a, um, uh, a similar upset about what people are seeing and, you know, but, but I think, the the problem is that it's it's global and and instant. You know, at least the Salem witch trials were pretty confined. But now, you know, trying to imagine some sort of conspiracy theory like that could spread to every corner of the earth uh, within seconds. Uh, and that that I think is always um, the ultimate trump card. I think um, legislators and regulators think they have, which is you you. This is not a harm that you can contain by just trusting that people are sensible. <laughs> Right, that there, there just are um, people out there willing to, um, willing to believe and sometimes act on crazy things. You know, the, the attempted, um, yeah, insurrection on January sixth was um, a relatively small percent of people uh, of of the country. Um, but of course, all of those people weren't a small percentage of the groups they found themselves in on social media. You know, and 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 that that's a, that's that's the problem is. Um, uh, enough people found each other online and organized online to gather and to you know do something quite frightening. Um, so yes, I, I now know I've been rambling. I'm trying to think if I even answered your question. But but the basic point is right that um, the the I, I I do think that social media is um, is different um, in in a fundamental sense, which is it is um, instant and global. Um, and so even if it is the case that people are just reacting to things we've reacted to for thousands of years, like outside threats we don't like, changes in society, um, social media just makes it easier for those reactions um, to, to, to spread. Yeah, I think you've identified right there what I see as the one of the biggest problems for liberalism with the kinds of digital platforms that we're, we're now seeing and that ultimately like you are defending, not in their particulars of like the way that Twitter manages itself or the way, but, but the idea of a world where we can go into a digital space and communicate freely with large numbers of people because they are the bigness. We might want to get away from the bigness in the sense of there are very large corporations that have total control over a significant percentage of digital expression. And we might want to replace that with distributed interconnected systems, but that still is a bigness in, and we don't, we want the bigness in the sense of if I put something out into the world, it can be seen freely by an extraordinary number of people and found very easily. Like that's that kind of communication we want to, we want that to persist. And a lot of the worries about like section 230 reform or these other bills, the UK bill is that they will they will hobble our ability to develop and maintain and innovate on these kind of worldwide networks. But that also does seem, as you, you mentioned or alluded to at the end of your last answer, a real problem for liberalism because one effect of that is people are exposed to a lot more difference than they used to be. That you, if you were in your small town you didn't really see what life was like outside of that small town, except for maybe how it was portrayed in the movies or if you traveled. But now you can have that weird lefty in Brooklyn retweeted into your feed and you have this, you suddenly have like a, a culture clash that would, did not exist before. You're like, oh my God, people are like, believe that sort of stuff. And it triggers a lot of latent authoritarianism in people. And so it's not it's not just that it enables people to act upon this stuff, but I think it causes these kinds of reactionary shut it down, the world is a scary and dangerous place, people are doing things that we need to put a stop to and so on. Values both on the right and 
and on the left, because the left can see the strange stuff that these people on the right are up to as well. And and I don't know what you do with that, because we want global reach, but it does seem like global reach is arguably a significant cause of, say, the rise of populism that we're seeing now and other kinds of authoritarian movements, because suddenly everyone's kind of thrust into each other's faces in a way that they didn't used to be. Yeah, I, I do think in um, a couple of years, um, you'll you'll see social media education basically being ubiquitous. I mean, I do think that kids these days are taught um, some elements, right, of social media safety and and all of this um, sort of stuff. Uh, uh, but fr- frankly, I think it's, it's quite likely that, that in 10 years, people look back and say, why was there not even more discussion about whether this mode of communication was even good? Like everyone just seemed to have accepted by definition it was. And um, I'm someone who's quite optimistic about technology and like um, new new things. Um, but I, I think that the data on uh, how social media sites affect, especially like young young girls and and young women, is quite concerning. Um, and uh, it may be the case that the outcome of this um, ongoing debate we're having about social media is not um, big um, pieces of legislation or uh, amendments to the constitution or the empowerment of a big regulatory agency. It's actually a cultural shift to, uh, I don't know, maybe millennials um, deciding once they have kids who get into, you know, um, teenage years, you know what, actually, I'm not going to let you just, you know, spend eight hours up in your bedroom on Instagram. (laughs) Uh, And uh, there will be a um, more thorough discussion amongst adults about how children should behave. And I think um, as the older generation of people believing a lot of these conspiracy theories um, go quiet that that will um, that will provide other other opportunities for discussion um, I've been struck oftentimes especially amongst conservative circles in the um, in the US and the UK at how much of the debate just seems to ignore um, non-government institutions there's this attitude of there's the individual who's harmed by social media and then there's the state and the idea that there are families in between or religious institutions in between or academia and education in between or journalism in between seems just sort of ignored. Uh, I'm, you know, it seems especially funny to me um, being here in London now because the online safety bill is being pushed by a conservative government. And it just seems to me bizarre that um, members of parliament who are from a political party, the conservative party that ostensibly cares a lot about um, the family and the importance of family, um, hasn't once, uh, none of them seem to be saying in the debate on the online safety bill, well, maybe, you know, parents have a role in <laughs> in telling kids they shouldn't be on, on their phone so much. Uh, and, and I think maybe it will um, get to the point that these online platforms that generate revenue through advertising, letting most people just appear and show up uh, to make the, to, to say what they want, that that becomes uh, unpopular and people embrace more closed elitist, um, uh, not in a bad way, but just, you know, become more, more curated uh, social media. I think a lot of people fr- freak out about things like Mastodon um, because uh, most people or many people hear about it and think, oh, this just sounds like a completely unwieldy, ungovernable morass, without realizing, I think, that actually it empowers a lot of ind- individuals to, to feel safe um, and to, to, to form their own communities. And so maybe we'll see more of that. Um, but when, when we, we're, we're yet to get to the point where uh, most lawmakers grew up with social media, um, or most regulators. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens when, when that occurs. Yeah, I think that the way that this gets framed as a lack of agency is really interesting. And and that seems to play out too with all of these past like new communication medium panics that are often driven by people who didn't grow up with them. So the worries about rock and roll turning the youth into juvenile delinquents was coming from old people who didn't grow up listening to rock and roll, right? Or comic books or whatever. But when we look back at those, we don't, very few people today 
would say, yeah, I have like I have the experience of being radicalized by the music I listen to. You know, like they they can see that that doesn't make any sense, or they're like, I am powerless in the face of the the ideological training or attitudinal adjustments that come from the books that I read. We just we we understand that there's an agency there that you can engage with this stuff. Or violent video games are really good. No one who actually plays violent video games is like these things are making me want to go out and shoot people. You know, it was the people who grew up not playing violent video games who felt that way because they didn't really understand what the engagement with it looked like. Um, and and that does seem to be a common thread in the current debates that there isn't an agency. I'm looking thinking back to like Josh Hawley. A few years ago, the senator proposed legislation that would have basically required, like, taken away all of this stuff that, like, Facebook does to make its feeds more engaging. Because the idea was essentially people who use Facebook are powerless against these tools, that they have, they lose their agency the moment they sign up for a Facebook account. And so, therefore, an outside authority needs to step in to adjust their relationship to Facebook because they can't do it themselves. It's, it's the same sort of rhetoric that it's used like, we need to keep drugs illegal because one hit of marijuana and you are a dope fiend for the rest of your life. Um, and, and so, I think you're, you're right that possibly the people who grow up with it will recognize that, no, that that model doesn't make any sense. I have a lot of agency. Yes, I probably use my phone more than I should. Um, yes, I wish I spent a little bit less time on Facebook than I do, but that's something that I have control over. Um, but but lack of agency is always the hook people use for, we need the heavy hand of government to come in because the people who are doing the stuff that we don't like are doing it because they have no control. I think that's that's um, that's a valuable and accurate insight. Um, the it, it reminded me though that um, oftentimes it's it's not just particular um, pieces of of art or technology that get people upset, but whole whole mediums. You know, the 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 novel began as something like pretty countercultural and weird, and now it's like considered one of the you know premier uh pieces of um of art and culture in society is the novel and similar with uh i guess yeah i'm I'm not a music historian but but my understanding is it's not as if opera came out of the box considered really high art that people would uh decide to you know put on their fanciest most expensive clothes and go out for an evening uh yeah, uh, the the rite of spring prompted a riot when it was first performed uh and and so there's all of this um, that kind of history, I think, should um, prompt people to, to to reassure themselves a little bit that, like, yeah, yeah, but we grew up, we got used to novels, you know, we got used to rock and roll, we got used to jazz, uh, we got used to the opera. Um, all of this stuff um, becomes a part of society in valuable ways if it's given um, the freedom for people to identify in, in a market. Okay, well, what's actually real? gold what's real crap you know let's um figure it all out and um, people people jettison the traditional critics and embrace things by themselves uh and and i think what you're seeing now is you know even when i was growing up uh video games were considered i I don't know what the correct term would be but kind of like low art right that it was not really something to be taken seriously it was something kids did and what what struck me as interesting recently is that um a lot of um, pieces of art, especially that um, are considered a little silly or not serious, become considered very serious when the people who grow up with them become adults, right? So, comic books, uh, video games. One now you can get you know university degrees or study video games. You can, um, and and I think it's fair to say that comic books have become, um, or at least. Um, the offshoots of comic books have become um, pretty successful icons in our culture. Uh, social media of, is this kind of weird in between because it didn't start with um, the real big innovator saying, well, we're going to target this to young people and, and children. It started with, you know, well, if you talk about the big platforms, right, like Facebook being the most obvious, right, it's, it started with um, young adults building new things for other young adults. 
uh, and and children have sort of gone on to the, become a major consideration on the platform uh, relatively recently. Um, but nonetheless, yeah, I think uh, yeah, I I, I remember uh, people thinking that social media was just going to be eternally something that people eventually grew out of. That it was going to be something people used for high school and college gossip, and then they would get jobs and they would stop doing this kind of stuff. Uh, it turns out that didn't happen. Um, and and uh, it, it remains to be seen um, if people eventually do kick a lot of these habits. But I think we're at this interesting point now where people who grew up with social media are still on it and their kids are getting onto it too. Um, and that's yielding some really interesting legislative, regulatory and social uh, conversation. Thank you for listening to Reimagining Liberty. If you enjoy this show, please take a moment to rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. You can also join our Discord listener community and book club by following the link in the show notes. Reimagining Liberty is a project of the Unpopulist and is produced by Landry Ayers. 